It's sneaking up on the end of July 2020, and we're closing in on hockey. That means decisions loom on the naming of the opening game starters for the NHL's return to play in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to In Goal Radio, the podcast. I'm your host, Darren Millard. Today, something very different. It's never happened before. Hutch and Woody both ended up away at the same time, enjoying a little time outside the in goal office, doing a little goalie focused work. They're on assignment. That means I'm in charge. I can do basically whatever I want. So I thought I'd put together a hybrid episode. Today, we'll bring you an interview that I was lucky enough to be allowed to do at the recent Western Hockey League Hockey Canada Goaltending Symposium, presented by In Goal Magazine. The person answering all of my questions is Calgary Hitman goalie coach Jason LaBarbera, who also happens to work with Hockey Canada and is a person with a very extensive pro hockey resume as a player. His time in the crease spanned a couple of different eras, both how we play the game, the equipment that we use, and how we teach the goaltending position. There are some great lessons in this conversation. And just to make sure this episode has that little dash of what's happening in the NHL world right now, after my chat with Jason, I'll give you my choice for Game 1 starter for all 24 teams. Go through the whole field. Woody and Hutch will likely disagree on more than one team, but they're not going to be able to say anything until next week. So think about it yourself as you listen to an in goal special edition interview with Jason LaBarbera. Bring in Jason LaBarbera, uh, who's been standing by and listening to the uh, conversation with uh, Carter Hart, uh, the Philadelphia Flyers, and Jason from uh, Hockey Canada, 11-year uh, professional career and uh, a graduate of the Western Hockey League. Anything you want to just pick up on uh, with Carter before we get into your career and uh, and do your philosophies? Yeah, I think there's there's lots of takeaways there. Um, you know, I think it's 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 funny when you. Uh, when you're playing junior hockey and how you can, you kind of dove in just to how much you have to grow up when you turn and play pro hockey, you know, that's, that, that might be the biggest difference, you know, be, between playing junior and turning pro is the lifestyle away from the rink. Um, your time management, like he said, uh, you have way more time, you know, on your hands to, to do things or to, to sort through that sort of stuff. And then just life, like laundry, you know, when you're in, when you're in junior, you have a billet doing everything for you. You know, your parents, you're used to your parents doing everything for you. And all of a sudden you're in a, an apartment in Pennsylvania and you're living with another guy who does no idea what he's doing either. Um, or you're by yourself. I mean, I remember being by myself my first year and my head was spinning. You, you get home from practice at 2 or 2.30 and you're like, now what am I supposed to do? You know, and, and some guys can go down the wrong path because they have all this time. And the, the, the guys that are real good pros, you know, learn to take care of themselves. But those sorts of things. And then just the being able to take information from so many different voices and trying to make it your own. Um, It's good that he kind of recognized the fact that he's going to get that as he goes along. Uh, And he's already obviously had that uh, so far, and he's going to continue to have that as he continues on in in his pro career, the amount of different coaches or different voices that he's going to have, but being able to filter through that and being, being open to that, I think was uh, a real good, insight on him as far as recognizing that early on in his career how would you have been as the athlete to your coach if you understand that question how would have i acted as a player to how i am as a coach yeah well you I, listen I, to I, your yeah your... like i think i i kind of coach how how i would have wanted to be coached you know how i would have wanted to be talked to how i would have wanted to be sort of taught and just how uh, the sort of demeanor I would have that I liked as a, and as how a, was as that? a player very positive very even keel um you know obviously I had a lot of goalie coaches throughout my career um you know I learned from so many different guys I took a lot of again you take a lot of info in as you go along and you retain all, some you know a lot of that stuff and um for me uh, the good the good part now that I, I enjoy now about coaching is you get to be yourself um, you know, and that is my, that's sort of my demeanor. And that's just kind of who I am is a pretty calm guy that uh, can sort of, you know, quiet things down when things get pretty hectic. What changed in the game during your playing career? Everything. Yeah. <laughs> like my, I, 
I won the MVP of the American League in 04, and I had no idea how to do a backside push, how to do a butterfly slide. Uh, I got up with the same leg. didn't matter what side the puck was on. My left leg was the first leg to get up every time. Um, pad stacks, like all that sort of stuff was, was um, super prevalent. And so I had to, I again, like going back to kind of what Carter was saying, like I had to be super open because the position started to really drastically change right around that time. And the following year, I got Ben Wilder as my coach in Hartford during the lockout was me and Stephen Valaket. And that I learned the most about the position that season because it had changed so much and it was so different. Um, just learning to do a backside push took me like six months to figure that out. Like it was hard. I had no idea what I was doing, um, you know, but you just stick with it and work with it. And then obviously now with the way the game is, you know, post play is obviously super important. Learning how to do a, you know, a one knee down or a VH or whatever you guys want to call it. At that time, like it was the same thing. You would just stand on your post, your legs like this, and hopefully the puck hit you or hopefully your D-man tied that guy up in front of the net if it was a pass, you know, and the game in that aspect has obviously changed a lot too. And um, yeah, it's been uh, it, even, even those, those years from like 04 to, you know, 2000, say 2009. And then I got to Vancouver with Ian Clark and like, learning how to do a knee shuffle and those sorts of things. Like it was all just new and so different. And then again, you, even towards the end of my career, learning how to do an RVH. Were you open all the time or did you think some of it was a little bit out there? No, I was super open. And, and again, it kind of goes back to the, you, you have to be open. Uh, I was probably too open at times. You know, I think as I went along, I probably, because I, you know, I ended up playing on a lot of teams as I kind of went along. Um, you know, I maybe lost a little bit of my identity of who I felt like I should play or how I should play, not necessarily how everybody else thought I should play. Um, but you have to be, you, you do have to be open. You have to be willing to learn, but you also, again, you got to be super, you really got to know yourself and your game and really what works for you. So taking info from everybody, but kind of filtering it as you go through. Uh, transition from player to coach was that uh was that easy for you it's been really good yeah you know and i got lucky i guess in the sense because my last year uh with the flyers organization i was kind of already you know you start thinking about it towards the end you know i was with anthony stolars my last year and uh he was a 21 year old raw super raw kid um you know and trying to kind of help him and guide him and this being in the American League at 35, you know, year round, 21, 22 year olds, you know, all year. So just doing that, and then I was lucky, just in the sense of, you know, I live in Calgary, and the the goalie coach position in, in Calgary with the Hitmen opened up right at the right time when I when I retired, and I knew some people in the organization, and um, you know, it was it was a pretty seamless transition. So just to be able to stay in the game right away was. Uh, it's been it's been good. Like I, I definitely don't miss playing, but I, I love the game obviously and I love being around the rink and being around the guys and trying to use a lot of the the experience that I have had over my career and trying to translate it to the young guys now. Uh, I'm not going to pretend that all goalie coaches are great, but uh like like anything, there's uh there's some great ones and there's some uh ones that aren't bad. Are uh, aren't uh awesome. So what what do you find the qualities in the really good ones and the ones maybe the qualities that the ones that you struggled with i think having that open sort of relationship with the goalie coach you know I, uh, the guys that aren't i mean there's certainly times to be firm with the goalie um but the guys that are that are that are understanding like there's it's not necessarily a dictatorship it's a more of a democracy and like at the end of the day as the goalie you're the one that has to go through it and you've got to be the one who's comfortable in your skin and comfortable with what you're being what you're doing what you're being told so having that open dialogue and that open relationship and again there's going to be times where you know as the coach and and even when I was playing you know there's times where you know I needed to be told that I wasn't this wasn't good enough I wasn't playing good enough or I wasn't practicing hard enough or whatever the sort of the message was there's times where yeah you know what we can we can have a good open relationship, but it, having an open relationship also means that when it's time to put the hammer down, 
it's time to put the hammer down and you have to be willing to accept that as well. Uh, what do you use as tools to evaluate your goaltenders during games? What are you looking at? Well, you're, you're, you're looking at, for me anyways, you know, their demeanor, their body language, you know, how they're handling certain situations. Um, you know, you're, you're obviously, you're, you're hoping to see some things that maybe you worked on throughout the week in practice. Obviously the junior schedule is a lot different than a pro schedule. There's a lot of weekend games. So you do have more practice time, you know, during the week, things that you've, you know, maybe shown on video or you've watched on video and then maybe, you know, making sure that they're aware of certain things that they're, you know, taking charge of situations. Um, they're not passive in the sense of, you know, not, not sitting back and, 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 and like say with their, like their defense, for example, if they're playing the puck, they're not, there's not, it's not a cluster back there. Like they're taking charge of what's going on back there. And, you know, little things like that, that maybe you you talk before the game, whether it's pre-scout stuff, you know, power play things, uh, just things that they're aware of that they, they, they might, you might see, you might recognize them picking up on that sort of stuff. But, um, just, you know, just, seeing how they're how they're reacting to the situations that's going on around them how do you um what's your philosophy on trying to treat every goaltender differently it's easy to say but it's it must be hard to do it is i think but you've got it i'm just big on you know you're building a relationship with each guy um you know and i and it and i guess based off just my experience i've been both guys I've been the starter and I've been the backup and I've even been the third guy and there's each, there's each, each guy needs different things. So it's not what you're not, you're not talking to them or, or necessarily teaching or coaching them with one big blanket. You're really trying to recognize, okay, this guy's, this guy's a better skater than this guy. So, you know what, maybe on this day we just, we need to work on skating. And even though he's good at that, it's still going to benefit him. Well, then the next day, this guy really struggles with traffic. The guy who's a good skater, well, then this guy's really good with traffic, who's not a great skater. And you just find ways to balance that stuff out, I think. And, it, and it's just, it comes down to building that relationship with those guys and talking to them and really getting an idea of where their mindset's at and what they're thinking about. Because, you know, you're right, you got two different guys, two different personalities, two different styles of how they play, two different guys and how they look at the game and just how they look at life. Um, so it's just vital to get to know both of them and really try to, work in sort of that sort of tandem uh let's talk about uh thoughts on on post coverage uh over overlap uh bad angle threats uh a philosophy there i told you stand like this (laughs) 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 Um, no it's 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 such a hot issue topic right uh you know in the in the goalie world it's there's it's such a unique way to play um those situations like everyone's got sort of their own philosophies for me it's more you know if there's i i look at it like i try to simplify it as much as you can for the goalie so there's some sort of game plan you know you don't at least i think you know you don't want to have a guy have a whole bunch of different things going on and he's 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 just making sort of things up as he kind of goes along as the situation sort of arises so you know if it's if it's a wide angle sort of play you know, and it's outside the dots and there's no sort of threat to the weak side, you know, I, I'd love to see him be squared up and overlap on those sorts of plays. If there, if he gets lower, obviously, and then there's more of a threat, you know, to the weak side, then, then you're getting into your post and your RVH and kind of going from there. And, you know, I, I know, you know, in the RVH, you know, especially when you're dealing with coaches and stuff that don't necessarily understand things uh, with, with, as opposed to goalies, you know, when you see that goal that might get, you know, shot by the short side by your by your goalie's ear, you know, and they get all mad about it and, and it, it becomes a hot button topic in the coach's office. I think it's, you know, you, you got to realize that the chances, the percentages of that shot actually going in is very, very low relative to that shot that's going across the slot line um, on a backdoor play or anything sort of, you know, across the, across the seam or whatever. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like it just gives you a better chance to make that higher percentage save. Um, you know, in that puck, you could probably take a hundred shots in that spot, you know, in that dead angle that it goes by a goalie's ear and it goes in once out of a hundred times. I think I would take those odds. 
Uh, you brought it up uh, being in the coach's room. Um, is that a difficult moment uh, when when coaches are upset about a goal and and how do you how do you handle it? It might be a bad goal. It might be a good goal. Yeah, it's uh, it's a unique thing, and that's one thing that's uh, you know different, I guess, for for goalie coaches because you know a lot of times you're upstairs and then you know you're not necessarily sure the pulse of the coach's room um you know after a period or or after a game and, and when you walk down there and you know you, you might think it was okay but then you walk in there and then you're just in a hornet's nest it's not easy you know and and you've got to you got to make sure that your thoughts are aligned as you're sort of coming down to that to that coach's office and make sure you're prepared for whatever comes your way um and and just organizing what it is that you want to say and sometimes it's fine and nothing happens, but as long as you're sort of prepared for whatever kind of comes your way, if the coach is like super hot and yelling at you for one goal that you might not think it was a bad goal, but you know, there's times where you, you know what, you might push back with them and you might argue it and be like, no, like that, that, that goal, uh, that was a good goal. Like you, what do you want them to do there? And you kind of go through that or you just, sometimes you just got to sort of take it at, it's funny with the, with the world junior team, the, um, the summer showcase, the hunters, Mark and Dale, like they're hilarious guys and they're unbelievably like they, they're the best storytellers. And like, I, I'd probably never laughed more in my life, but I also was probably never more on the defensive more in my life either. Cause they're real hard on goalies. And if you watch those, uh, the summer showcase games with uh, Cole Caulfield, he beat both of the goalies short side um, with just, great shots like I mean you, you couldn't have you couldn't have he couldn't have put it in a better spot and I'd come down after uh after the game or after the period and it was like non-stop just all over me about it I'm like first of all those aren't my goalies so I don't know what you want me to do about it but the and it, but it, the funny part about it was you know it was on uh Hunter Jones and Alex S. Gravel and the funny part about it was like that argument never stopped from like August or till I guess the end of July till like January 7th. It was, it was a nonstop, like they would be all over me about it. And I would, you know, I, as it were, went along, I, you know, I continued to fight back on it and, uh, it got a little old at times, but, uh, it became kind of a running joke as well, but yeah, you got to find, you got to just, you got to feel the room. You got to feel the situation, whether it's, you know, right to push back in that moment or not. Um, game day routine or pregame routine for a goalie coach and a goalie. What is yours? Uh, to me, it's whatever the goalie wants. I think you just develop some sort of plan. Like Carter Hart, Carter talked about his 10 minutes that he would go on the ice. Now junior is a little different because we don't have a whole lot of access, especially in Calgary. We don't have a whole lot of access to, to morning skate ice. Um, a little bit different on the road, but I think it's, you know, if you're, if, you know, especially in the NHL or, you know, in any, even in junior, like a lot of times you're not having a full team pregame skate. So even if there's 10 minutes, like Carter said, he's got sort of his 10, 10 minutes worth of drills that he really likes to do before, before a game. Um, I think, I think the whole purpose of it is just to go out there and feel the ice, feel the puck, get a little light sweat, just kind of get yourself going in the morning, but you don't necessarily want to overdo it. What's uh, what's the challenges in identifying a goaltender for for Team Canada in a in a World Championship? It's uh, it's tough, you know. They were certainly lucky, you know, the last few years in the sense of well, Carter Hart was the guy, you know, for two years, and everybody knew that Carter was going to be the guy. And then the following year after Carter was Michael DiPietro, and everybody knew that he was going to be the guy. Last year was a you know, it was a completely different game. Um, nobody knew who our guys were going to be. Um, you know, if you if you kind of follow through that whole process of of how it played out, you know, uh, Joel Hofer and Nico Dawes were weren't even involved in the summer goalie camp. They had never done anything with Hockey Canada. They weren't at the summer showcase. They, you know, I mean, Joel Joel the, the, Joel had been drafted, and it was a high draft. He was a fourth round draft pick, and it had started to build up his Western Hockey League career. And Nico just came out of nowhere. Um, he really wasn't on the radar till November. So you're, we watched a ton of video, you know, myself and Lyle Mast. Um, you know, Brad McEwen does a really good job of sort of identifying who the guys are sort of on the radar. And 
you know, obviously you can't see them play live, but you, you, you watch a ton of video just kind of throughout that whole process. And then, you know, use some of the analytics that Hockey Canada has access to and kind of go from there. What is there something that usually stands out to you? Like maybe, maybe we'll take Joe Hofer, for, uh, for example, like something that, that maybe swung him, uh, in favor. Well, I guess, I mean, both those guys, like they were, they, like they were playing so well, like, like they were just, they were trending. They were, they were two top guys in the CHL and they, I mean, they were dominant when you, when I would watch their games, you know, even more so Joel, I got to see him play a lot more. He was dominant. Like, you know, and, and, and Dan would know, Dan De Palma would have seen him a few games, you know, him and Hofer and Grand went at it a couple of times. It was just like lights out goaltending. And it was fun to like watch that, those videos and be like, this guy's got another level that I'm not sure anybody realizes yet because he hadn't been through the program. Um, so now, you know, you kind of have to go to, you have to, you know, put your, put your work boots on and go to work in the sense of, of, of pushing for him. And uh, luckily, you know, Lyle and I are on the same page with that. And, and then we have to go to the management staff and say, look, like this guy is, this guy's pushing and he's trending in the right direction. And he's, he's, playing at an elite level right now and he's a guy that you know we really felt like could could be a guy for us for 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 the world junior tournament what are you uh if you're looking at uh at a whl goalie uh what are the fundamentals that that you want to see in in the game before you start working on all the other stuff well obviously they need to be athletic you know they be able, they need to be able to move their skating their edge work they need to obviously you know, keep up to a high pace. Like, are you, are you talking about like world juniors? You mean? No, I'm, I'm more Western hockey. Like, uh, just if, if you've got a guy coming into camp and he, he looks like he could make your team, what, uh, he's raw, might be raw, but what are some of the things that you, that you need to see from that, that athlete? Yeah. Like that, just that athletic ability. I think, you know, I'll use a guy for us in Calgary, for example, Braden Peters. Um, he was a fifth round pick for us. Tons of raw athletic ability, you know, a lot, you know, the, the technical aspect of things is good, but it's, you know, he's, he's still got a ways to go. And the one thing with him is like, he's got the best hands I've seen of a junior hockey goalie. Like his hands are unbelievable. And, and any of the guys that are on here that are from Alberta that know him or that have worked with him, they know how elite his hands are. So even at what fit, makes good hands, what makes his, what, his what makes ability, you say that? well, his ability to catch the puck. I mean, I've never seen a guy again, catch the puck like he can. Um, just his way of, of being able to read releases and, and get his hands to where he needs to get them to, um, making saves in front of him. Um, and they're dynamic. Like, I mean, he was a really good ball player growing up. So that certainly helped. Like he was a, he was a good athlete in that sense. Um, but even at like, you know, when we drafted him at, I guess, 14 or 15, when he came to camp, you're like, there could be something there in, in, in a year or two, if he really kind of digs in and works just, just based off his raw athletic ability. Uh, go-to drills. What are your go-to, uh, drills at our practice? Um, well, like most guys have said on here, you know, you usually steal drills. So there's, uh, there's a handful of stuff that Lyle, that Lyle Mass does that I like, um, you know, whether it's those six shot cradles, um, you know, from three different spots. Um, uh, there's one that I, that I use quite often. It's just, I, I call it a power play simulation. It's just, you know, you've got all the pucks are up top and there's three shooters and they're all, they're all stationary. It's just a pass down, pass across shot, pass down, pass across shot, pass down, pass cross, pass up, pass down, pass across, pass up shot. It's a four shot drill. Gets the guy, it gets the goalies working their feet. It gets them track in the pockets. It's, it's a simple drill, but it's super effective. How often do you want to work with your goaltenders in a, in a course of a sort of a regular week during the, during the season? You try like I mean again for junior you know junior is different I guess because you're it's such a developmental league so you know you're you're con like if I can get fifteen to twenty minutes you know a day with them and I'm I'm lucky in Calgary because I'm there all the time you know a lot of guys don't have that access in the league they're there for you know four or five days a month sort of thing so um, you know but there's days where I'm like you know what like these guys are sick of me they, they like I'm just gonna back off and you know we don't need a goalie practice or goalie skate this morning. Uh, just make sure you're warmed up before you get on the ice and let's just go practice. And it's just, it's just having that feel of kind of where they're at. And, and uh, you know, you try and you, you try and get as in as much as you can. Cause I, you know, I think there's certainly benefit to it, but 
it can also be a hindrance too when you're there all the time because they rely they can rely on you probably too much and i think it's uh you know sometimes it's a good thing to sort of back off and like listen guys like you, you know you got to sort of you really got to understand your own game and really sort of be able to figure some things out on your own without constantly looking at me for for answers curious about your journey when you came from like a freestyle goaltender into all these different techniques uh, through the middle of course of your career. Now as a goalie coach, the emphasis on technique to athleticism. As far as like, like the balance of it. Yeah. Where, where do you, well, it looks you like we're going to more athletes, but you can't teach athleticism, you know? So I think, you know, I, I think any guy will say like, I'd love to have the athletic guy and be able to, to rein him in a little bit. Um, you know, there's guys that are like, I, I, I kind of use the term, like they're a thoroughbred horse that needs to get tamed. You know, like they're, they're just a wild horse that's all over the place, but you see the raw athletic ability and they just need to get, you need to get reined in a little bit, slow down. Uh, and those are the fun guys to work with because then you can teach, you know, the technical side of things and sort of slow them down because they already have that, raw athletic ability you, you can't you, you can't teach that you can't coach it they either have that or they don't what have you learned the most as a goalie coach from the first time that you started this uh this chapter of your life to uh today and at the tail end of the symposium uh i'd say a few things like um one um you know dealing with the rest of the coaching staff i think is a vital um and and some of the nhl guys have talked about it on here I, I just think it's a it's a huge com- component of, of being a goalie coach. Sometimes we can, you know, goalies in general can just isolate themselves. Goalie coaches can isolate themselves and just be like, I'm the goalie coach and that's it, and not necessarily integrating themselves into the rest of the coaching staff. Um, I think it's a super important thing to do. Um, and then, again, I, I think these things like this are just phenomenal because we get to share ideas and thoughts and, I think that part of just the coaching part of it, even when I played, I mean, I, I always would look at the goalie coaches and be like, why is everybody so private about everything? Like, why, why is everybody so dug into like their thoughts and ideas? Like they're, they're the only ones that have like thought of this or come up with these answers. So it's a cool thing for everyone to just be open and share. And it's, it's, there's, there's nothing to hide. There's no secrets. We're all for the most part speaking the same language and thinking a lot of the same things and uh, these sorts of things. And even though I played like, doesn't matter. Like I can, I can lean on some experiences, but the actual coaching aspect of things I learn from everybody doing their, their presentations every day. Do you ever get caught up in telling uh, stories on the ice back in the day? I did this or he wouldn't believe that or. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not a great guy about that story, storytelling stuff. I, I, I forget what happened yesterday. So <laughs> unless, unless somebody kind of triggers me and, and kind of reminds me of things, I'm like, I'm all about what, whatever happens right now, what's going to happen tomorrow. Well, that's a good thing. We'll have some of this stuff on the uh, Ingle Mag, so you'll be able to rehash it uh, or re- go down that memory lane whenever you want. If uh, just as a reminder, uh, Jason, I'm a big fan. Uh, followed your career. Uh, this has been a lot of fun uh, chatting with you at the tail end of this seminar. Uh, thanks for this, and congratulations on your uh, success here. Thanks, Darren. I appreciate it. It was good talking to you. There's Jason right. LaBarbera, uh, Woody. Uh, that's been fun uh, with uh, with both Carter and Jason. Two very different perspectives from two uh, two professional goaltenders and now goalie coach. Yeah, I know. Um, and uh, nice to have a pro actually running the show here. Uh, thanks, Garrett, for taking the time. Out of you didn't mind my dog Give barking? some credit, Kevin. Come on. Yeah. Fr- Friday night in Vegas, and he's hanging out with us goalies. <laughs> and you know that this guy is a goalie at heart when he's doing this. I got to say, Jason, I know you say you don't tell stories, but I, I was trying to cue Darren up uh, probably too late to give him enough notice, but I seem to recall about one, one about how you might have got your first chance in the NHL, starting from the coast and some activities there that I remember you telling one year that, the coaches might enjoy hearing that. Oh, the story I told last year? At the POE, yeah. I, that yeah, was one we're... of the better ones. Are we okay to tell that one? Uh, I can tell if you want, yeah. Yeah, go for it. We'll, we'll wrap up on that note in a few things. <laughs> uh, well, I was, was, I was 21, so it was my second year pro. I was playing in Charlotte in East Coast League, and we were playing uh, a playoff game. I think it was game four against Ed- the Atlantic City Boardwalk Bullies. <laughs> a great name eh? <laughs> and uh we were we were up two games to one and obviously if we would have won that game it was the best of five so we would have been done or the series would have been over and i was awful 
I mean, we weren't great, but I was terrible. And it was 6-1, I think, like halfway through the game. And our coach obviously had enough. And thank God he, he pulled he, – well, I, I, now in, in hindsight, he probably should have left me in there. But he, uh, I, I got pulled, and I was obviously wasn't happy. So I was skating back to the bench and, you know, not happy. And, and for whatever reason, I just decided to throw my stick. Um, so when you go on the bench, there's a hallway. And instead of throwing it like a harpoon, I threw it sideways. So the blade was up. Well, there just happened to be a, a kid hanging over the over the uh, the railing. So I go back to the dressing room and I'm I'm trying to calm down. I don't realize what happened. I have no idea. So I, I you know I, I probably like five minutes in the room, kind of pacing around, like grab a, some water, so try and calm down. Come back to the bench and I like all of a sudden I could just hear this like everybody behind me in the stands like screaming at me, like swearing and like losing their minds. And I look back and I'm like what is going on? I'm like, did I, like, did I hit somebody? And I see this kid, he's got a towel on his head and he's bleeding. So I'm like, Oh my God, I'm sorry. Like, I'm so sorry. And like, you know, like you yeah, feel awful. So then about two minutes later, like all of a sudden there's this guy like on, on the glass. So right, right beside the bench on the glass, he's like, he jumps, he climbs the glass and he's got a suit on and he's screaming at me and he's pointing at me and he's swearing at me. And he's like, you're going to jail. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, what is, like, who is this guy? So then our coach comes flying down the bench and grabs this guy by the tie. And now they're yelling at each other on the bench. And it's the other team's GM. So now I'm like, what is, like, I, I'm, like, white as a ghost. I don't really unnecessarily understand what happened. So the security guys kind of broke it up. Our coach kind of calms down. The guys are, like, on the bench, like, what in the heck's going on? So then, whatever, a couple minutes later, I feel this tap on my shoulder. And I could hear the crowd just start like getting louder. And I turn around and it's the police. Now the police are on the bench. So now I'm like, what the heck is going on? Like, I have no idea what I did. And so all of a sudden, like the crowd, so I stand up, the cops are like, you're coming with me, with us. And I'm like, okay. And the whole crowd, like, no, no joke in Atlantic City, there's like 6,000 people there. And the whole crowd's chanting, lock him up, lock him up. <laughs> So everybody figured out what was going on. So I, I'm like, I'm white as a ghost. Like I'm scared out of my mind. And so I go back to the, to the dressing room with the cops and they're like, what happened? Like, what did you do? And I'm like, I have no idea. I threw my stick. I was mad. The game's not going well. I don't know what happened. So they're like, okay, they kind of took my statement or whatever. And they took my stick into evidence, but it wasn't the right stick. I gave them the wrong one. <laughs> and uh, anyway, the so the league, the East Coast League suspended me for 18 games. So I got suspended for 18 games. And so then I went to Hartford and I went to Hartford and like two days later, the Americans, League, American leagues, well, we're, we're upholding your suspension in the East Coast League. So you can't play in the American League in the American League playoffs. Like you're done. So somebody, somebody in New York got hurt. Like I, it might've been you know, Mike Donham or UC Markin or, or Mike Richter or one of those guys that was there at the time. So they're like, well, the only guy we can call up is you. So I went up to New York for like three weeks and made NHL money and practiced. And I was suspended in all the other leagues for 18 games, but that was the last game I played in the East coast league. But yeah, it was, uh, it, <laughs> it was quite the experience. And yeah, I, I always, I, somewhere I have the VHS tape and it's like super, super grainy, but I need to go digging through it just to kind of relive it again because it was uh, it's pretty funny now. I think I think you should put that one on YouTube. Tell this story <laughs> and, and you know put the check the box that allows you to monetize YouTube. I think you'll be making some good money with that one. <laughs> I know it wasn't necessarily in the theme of what we've been doing here, but I had to have that story shared <laughs> because I'd heard it before and it's a beauty, Jason. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. I like how Jason played the game. He's big, he was creative, athletic, and physical. I also really appreciate how he thinks about the game right now. I'm looking forward to following his career on the coaching side. Uh, his connection to his goaltenders is really strong, unique, and genuine. Before we go, as promised, my guess, or should I say, who I would start in every team's opener of the Stanley Cup playoffs. It's a little bit different who I 
think would start and who I would start are very different. Uh, so we're going to go by conference, by series, and then by round robin, east to west. So this is who I would start in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Peter Mrazek versus Henrik Lundqvist, Carolina over the Rangers. The reason I start Lundqvist is you can go back to Shesterkin. I'm not sure how great that Henrik Lundqvist is going to feel being called upon as a, a backup and, and rescue a series. But maybe I'm wrong. He's a pro. Probably be fine. But that's just my thinking there. Elvis Merzlikens against Freddie Anderson, Columbus and the Leafs. Pittsburgh and Montreal, Tristan Jari and Carey Price. Florida, Bob faces Semyon Varlamov and the Islanders. And in the round robin, I'm going to go with Vassy for Tampa, Tuca, hope that finger heals on the glove hand uh, for the Boston Bruins. Braden Holpe goes for Washington, and I would start Carter Hart in Philadelphia. Now, this is providing everybody's, of course, healthy, and we've seen a couple of guys mispractice. In the West, Mike Smith looks across at really, who knows at the time that I'm taping this, uh, for the Chicago Blackhawks, but they're still hoping Corey Crawford is going to accompany the team to Edmonton. If not, it's going to be Malcolm Subban. So a little bit of an asterisk there. Asterisk. Connor and Big Save Dave when Calgary and Winnipeg dropped the puck. Vancouver has Jacob Markstrom. I lean toward Devin Dubnik for new Minnesota coach Dean Evison. And Arizona will send Darcy Kemper against Pekka Rennie. Round Robin teams. Binnington. Grubauer. Bishop and Marc Andre Fleury for the Blues, Avalanche, Stars, and Golden Knights. Now, there's a lot of time left until we start playing the real games on August 1st. We'll see what happens, but I'm curious. Let me know who you would pick. Compare my selections to yours. Let me know via Twitter or our social media channels, uh, or just uh, send us an email and uh, we'll try and get some of that reaction on in next week's podcast. I'm Darren Millard, turning off the lights at In Goal Radio, the podcast. I think it went pretty well. Don't think I broke anything. Ah, crap. See ya.